Okay, so welcome back uh, to um, the session. I'm uh, Erland Nier. Uh, I work in uh, the Monitoring Capital Markets Department at the IMF. Uh, I'm going to introduce the, the policy uh, panel that we have here as part of the session uh, entitled Macroprudential Policy Taking Stock and Approaching uh, New Frontiers. Um, just had an um, announcement on some changes to the lineup. Uh, Amir Yaron was, uh, was uh, announced but is unable to join uh, the panel, the Central Bank of uh, Israel Governor. Also, Tobias uh, Adrian was meant to uh, chair the panel, but he had to fly back to uh, Washington. And so he is instead uh, uh, going to be online. Um, and we thought uh, it would be most practical, uh, perhaps for me, to try and moderate uh, the, the panel from here in Frankfurt. Uh, with Tobias joining uh, as one of the four uh, panelists. Um, so with that, uh, let me uh, introduce the panelists real quick. Uh, so we have Klaas Nott, who is the uh, president of the, the Niederlandsche uh, Bank and chair of the Financial Stability Board. He's had a distinguished career uh, in the Netherlands as well as internationally, I think including even a stint at the IMF as an economist in the European department uh, way back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, Nelly Liang uh, online, who is now uh, the Under Secretary of the United States Treasury uh, for domestic finance and has previously had a, a long and distinguished uh, career at the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, welcome, uh, Nelly. Uh, then we have uh, Vas uh, Maduros, who uh, is uh, serving as the uh, deputy uh, governor of the Central Bank of Ireland. And uh, prior to that has had, again, a distinguished career at the Bank of England. Um, and then uh, our fourth panelist, uh, of course, then is, uh, is Tobias, who everyone knows as the financial counselor and director of the Monetary and Capital Markets Department at the Fund. So there's two themes to the uh, policy panel that we have uh, communicated with the panelists in advance. Uh, one is, what have been the main challenges to the effective use of macroprudential policies so far? Um, and what is the international experience? And um, the second uh, theme for the panel is sort of looking, looking forward, how should uh, policymakers approach some of the new frontiers of uh, macroprudential policy, including potentially uh, the approaches to take for risks in the non-bank financial systems, approach, approaches to take to regulating crypto, and uh, to perhaps trying to control some, some systemic risks also that might arise from climate. Um, so in terms of the, the proceedings, we're going to have an initial round. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and we'll have, after that initial round, we'll have a couple more rounds of, you know, looking back and, and looking, looking forward, uh, and also a Q&A at the end. For the initial round, the order uh, that we've agreed was uh, Class Note uh, was going to go first. Uh, and, and I think, Class, you have some slides. Um, Nelly Liang is going to be second. Uh, and then uh, Vasma Duros and Tobias uh, Adrian uh, last. So, uh, note, uh, the floor is yours. So thank you, Erland. Uh, many thanks for your kind uh, introduction and also to you and Tobias for putting this, uh, this panel together. Uh, I don't have slides, I have words. Um, and I have some words but definitely not enough words to ever deal with such a complex and fascinating topics. But what I will try to do is uh, to focus on just a few high level issues regarding uh, the effective use and the challenges that we face in implementing macroprudential policy. But first of all, uh, we should not forget that this is still a relatively new uh, discipline. Eh? It only originated after uh, the global financial crisis. 
And at that point in time, yeah, we first needed to uh, design the tools to fix the fault lines in the financial system that became inevitable uh, then. And then gradually over time, of course, the efforts shifted from design to implementation. And I think this is already an illustration of the fact that these challenges that we talk about today are rapidly evolving. So now I think today the focus is very much uh, on also using the tools and evaluating their effectiveness and their efficiency. But of course, as we do that, new risks also present themselves to which we have to adapt uh, our uh, macroprudential policy. So what I intend to do in this opening remarks is first discuss some of these challenges that relate to implementing the existing macroprudential tools. And there I will obviously draw mainly on the experiences of, let's say, the Netherlands as a member state within the euro system. And then I'll move on to the new frontiers of macroprudential policy development, which are arguably global uh, in nature and where the FSB jointly with the IMF uh, has a leading role to play. Now, first on the challenges of using macroprudential tools, let me begin with the observation that there is still a lot of room for improvement and that I also understood uh, from the uh, presentation that I just listened to. If you, for instance, take, look, take a look at the, uh, the way euro area jurisdictions apply macroprudential tools in practice, there is still a lot of difference and differences that cannot always be objectively uh, explained. Look, for instance, at the harmonized framework that we have for identifying uh, domestically systemically uh, important banks for the identification, the, uh, the framework is uh, indeed harmonized. But then there is no further guidance on how to calibrate actually the buffers that go with it. And as a result, you can have two banks with similar scores uh, on the indicators for systemic importance, such as size to GDP, interconnectedness, lack of substitutability. But then they can end up facing quite different uh, requirements. If you look at most of the big banks in Europe that fall within the range of, let's say, one to two and a half percent of risk weighted assets when it comes to buffer allocation. But some of these allocations bear no apparent relationship to the scores uh, that were assigned. And I think it is important eh, that we further investigate such heterogeneity, but that we also actively think about sort of what mechanisms could we put in place to correct for this in order to ensure a true uh, level playing field. When it comes to evaluating the effectiveness and the efficiency of macroprudential tools, I believe that our main challenge is that we have to make sure that the regulatory framework remains fit for purpose, that it remains sufficiently capable to address uh, systemic risk. So it is about adaptability. The financial sector is ever changing, and I think that's why we have to keep an open mind uh, with respect to developing our framework. Now, Against that background, allow me to highlight some lessons that I think are relevant from the last couple of years. First, I think it's equally important that we understand what macroprudential policy can do and also what it cannot do. If you have a look at the macroprudential toolkit, I think what I'm talking about is in the Netherlands, but I think it is uh, quite sort of relevant in other countries uh, as well. That toolkit, that toolkit is mainly geared toward building bank buffers and building resilience. Ideally, of course, in an ideal world, the macroprudential authority should also have sufficient tools at its disposal to limit the cyclical buildup of excessive risks at a much, much earlier stage. And here, of course, I'm thinking about measures like borrower-based instruments. But these borrower-based instruments often interact with political economy uh, deliberations, and that's why uh, they are usually not assigned to macro-prudential uh, authorities. So that's also a reason why I will not dwell too much further uh, on it here. Let's dwell on the things that we can actually uh, actively influence. Second, I do think that the COVID pandemic has demonstrated to us the great values of having sufficient capital buffers that can not only be built up, but it can also be released. Uh, this releasable capital should supplement a sufficiently large layer of the structural buffers, 
But that releasable part should then be usable uh, in the face of adverse uh, shocks. It should thereby uh, give banks additional room to absorb losses, but keep the credit flowing. Now, this is also very much the spirit within which we took a couple of decisions uh, in the Netherlands, uh, where we recently revised our framework to target a 2% counter-cyclical capital buffer in what we called an environment in which risks are neither subdued nor elevated. In other jurisdictions, uh, that is being referred to as a sort of positive neutral rate. Um, but that is uh, something in the Netherlands we, uh, we introduced. And that brings me to my uh, third lesson, um, and that is, of course, that it is important to bring BIF buffers uh, early on. So uh, building capital in times when the risks are slowly on the rise, when financial conditions are still favorable, when bank profitability is still there, uh, that is absolutely necessary in order to uh, be able to prepare the sector for adverse times and also to avoid difficult situations later on such as the one in which uh, regulators may want to increase capital requirements, but then fear the procyclical effects that this could bring about. In the same vein, there is also merit in taking better into account both the benefits and the cost of capital requirements when determining the right policy mix. Uh, the financial industry will tell you all about the costs of bringing on capital requirements. I think uh, it behooves us to also be very clear and much more outspoken about the benefits. And I believe that this is still relevant also in the current juncture, uh, where the profits in the European banking sector are still looking rather healthy while the uncertainty about the future macro-financial environment is now clearly on the rise. And maybe an interesting subject for discussion also for the panel is whether 2022 was not a little bit of a missed opportunity in this regard. Good. Uh, despite it, it is clear that we have come a long way. Um, but I also believe eh, that macro prudential policy will have to continue to evolve. It will have to continue to involve making difficult decisions, eh, decisions based also on expert judgment in quite an uncertain environment. Decisions that will not always be popular, but that's why I believe it's very important that we communicate also actively on these measures, not only with the sector, but clearly also with the public at large in order eh, to make the policy more acceptable and hence more effective. If I sort of look forward uh, on this specific topic, I think the recent banking turmoil in March drives home also the question of whether our policy tools are sufficient to, for instance, counter the macro prudential risk of a systemic liquidity crisis. And then also specifically for Europe, I believe we have to ask ourselves whether having a true banking union warrants further consistency in national practices, for example, with the use and the application of the countercyclical buffer, and also a reflection on whether a countercyclical macroprudential tool at the European level would also be warranted over and above those at the national level. So let me now turn to the new frontiers, the second part of the question of the panel, the new frontiers of macro prudential policy, including, of course, areas like non-bank financial intermediation, crypto assets and climate. And all these areas, I think, affect financial stability. So all these areas, in principle, require action. Starting with MVFIs and in particular with investment funds, yeah, they have shown their potential to generate systemic risk in the past as early as uh, long-term capital management in 1998, but also more recently, the March 2020 dash for cash, the Archegos uh, collapse and the UK guild market uh, episode. On crypto assets, it's clear that these activities cannot yet be considered systemically relevant, but it is also true that traditional financial institutions have been expanding their participation in such markets. And that is, of course, worrisome from a global financial stability perspective, considering eh, crypto's inherent volatility and their global reach. On climate change, eh, just this summer, we have witnessed a range of extreme weather events across Europe, from wildfires to torrential rains and floods, presenting a stark reminder of the systemic dimension of climate change. And in addition to such extreme events, a disorderly transition 
to a low carbon economy could also have some destabilizing effect. So macro prudential policy can play a role in, uh, in addressing all of these risks. But it's also true that in developing new, of course, there are even more challenges than when it comes to implementing something that we sort of have known already a little bit longer. And what makes it even more complicated is that both the NBFI and the crypto asset sectors are, of course, characterized by a great variety of entities, of activities and of business models. There is simply less homogeneity uh, in that sector. And a one size fits all approach to enhancing its structural and cyclical resilience is therefore unlikely to be successful. In both cases, it is difficult to properly gauge systemic risk. Also, because there are lots of data gaps still out there, and there is simply a lack of harmonized uh, analytical tools. When it comes to climate change, I believe that uncertainty is even larger, uh, as it is simply difficult to know how and when climate-related risks will materialize. Now, given the inherently cross-border nature of activity and risks in all these areas, global coordination and consistency are of course of the utmost importance uh, to avoid that otherwise the risks would simply shift elsewhere so how should we approach these new frontiers now let me highlight some considerations for macro prudential policy in nbfi as this is probably out of the three areas the area where the discussions at this moment are the most uh, advanced at this stage as in the banking sector, macroprudential policy for NBFI should seek to prevent the buildup of risks, make the financial sector itself more resilient, and limit contagion by focusing on the system as a whole. But although the objective is similar, the approach uh, may be quite different, and that is due to the nature of systemic risk in NBFI. Uh, if we take, for instance, the example of investment funds, if you look at the economic functions of NBFI, then investment funds are really the bulk of uh, where the action is. Whereas systemic risk in the banking sector often revolves around the solvency of individual entities, systemic risk in the investment fund sector generally revolves around liquidity imbalances arising as a result of collective actions of cohorts of funds generating these uh, these sharp spikes in liquidity demand but therefore the practice of applying higher requirements to systemically important institutions such as higher capital buffers is unlikely to be the central feature of a macro prudential policy uh, uh, with respect to nbfi a macro prudential approach to investment funds should therefore be primarily activity based rather than entity based and include requirements that would apply to all entities within a specific cohort, regardless of their individual systemic relevance. And in this way, macroprudential policy would presumably raise the baseline of existing microprudential requirements at the fund level by embedding the macroprudential perspective. It would allow funds to internalize their potential impact on the wider financial system. So looking ahead, I see three uh, important components in the evolution of macro prudential policy for NBFI. First, we should finish important parts of the ongoing work to address structural vulnerabilities. You simply cannot run before you walk, right? Following the March 2020 market turmoil, analytical and policy work at the FSB level has focused on enhancing money market fund resilience, on liquidity mismatch in open-ended funds, on the excessive use of leverage, and on the lack of liquidity preparedness in the context of margin calls. And work is still ongoing in many of these areas. And importantly, this does include assessing whether existing tools can be repurposed, repurposed by embedding the macroprudential perspective which would then likely lead to simply raising the baseline of existing requirements. Second, we should focus on enhancing capabilities in the area of data availability, governance, and analytical tools to adequately gauge systemic risk. Uh, 
in addition to a solid microprudential foundation, this is the key to any macroprudential approach. It is hard to front load macroprudential policy in the fog. And third, we should assess the need for additional macroprudential tools, including the hands, those in the hands of authorities, rather in the hands of the firms uh, themselves, to address the remaining risks that are not mitigated by embedding the macroprudential perspective in existing regulation. Now, finally, a few words on the other two areas, the approach for crypto assets. I believe it's going to be fairly similar in that the focus should first be on building microprudential re regulation and then make sure that it's globally consistent to avoid arbitrage. Then we need to understand, again, the data gaps and improve what our understanding of what actually constitutes systemic risks in this sector, including the spillover and the potential spillovers to banks and the more traditional asset classes. And in the case of climate, finally, I believe that the existing banking macroprudential toolkit already provides a starting point, but it simply needs better fine tuning to capture climate related risks and to prevent them from building up to build resilience in case these risks materialize and so on. So the mechanism in all of these sectors eh, is roughly the same, but I do think the level of advancedness of the stage we're in is quite different where we clearly eh, farther advance, advanced in the banks than in the non-banks, than in the crypto, than in the climate space. So let me stop here and uh, look forward to an interesting exchange of views uh, with the other panelists and with you in the audience. Thank you. So, so Nelly, please, uh, the floor is uh, yours. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Erlen. Thank you to the organizers uh, for inviting me to participate in this panel today. I'm sorry, I can't be there in person, um, but have been enjoying the conversation and discussion so far very much. Um, I'm going to talk about some recent developments in macroprudential policy making in the United States. Um, and through some examples that are designed to highlight some of the challenges. Um, as other speakers have already said, macroprudential policy making is still relatively new in advanced economies, having become more mainstream only after the global financial crisis. Uh, the core idea, as you know, is underpinning these policies is that regulators need to take a holistic approach to safeguard the broader financial system. That means regulators need to consider not only what is appropriate for individual financial institutions or markets, they also need to think about how the different parts are exposed to one another and how they interact to provide credit and other vital services to support economic activity. Uh, most countries have established new financial stability committees. Uh, David Eggman mentioned that this morning, and I've done research on this in the past. And these are designed to help ensure that financial authorities consistently consider financial stability risks. This work requires that regulators more formally communicate and coordinate on a regular basis to use existing tools and adopt new tools uh, to address vulnerabilities identified. All this is to say that macroprudential policy making can be quite complicated. So I want to walk through uh, three examples today of how macroprudential policy in the US are being developed and to illustrate that they need to be very flexible and adaptive. Um, I'm defining macroprudential policy broadly to include both cyclical and structural policies. The first example concerns how to identify and address vulnerabilities in the non-bank financial sector. The second example uh, concerns counter-cyclical features of bank capital in the United States. And the third is about bank liquidity risk management in light of the accelerated runs on uninsured deposits that we saw earlier this year. So starting with non-bank financial intermediaries, um, as others have noted, noted, this is just a big growing part of uh, providing credit to the economy 
Uh, it's more than doubled relative to banks in the U.S. Um, and banks, as you know, also prov are a pro large provider of funding for this sector. In the U.S., uh, these entities have traditionally been regulated to protect investors and consumers, and in some cases for safety and soundness, like insurance companies. Um, in 2010, the Financial Stability Oversight Council was created, and it is charged in the U.S. with identifying and responding to potential risks to financial stability, including those that come from non-bank intermediaries and activities. Since its inception, the FSOC has worked with financial regulators to evaluate where systemic risks could be significant and work to how to reduce those vulnerabilities using that arise from financial uh, activities and products. In addition, the Dodd-Frank Act empowered the FSOC to designate a non-bank financial institution as a systemically important financial institution, or a SIPI, if it determined that material distress at the company or the, and this is def statute, nature, scope, size, scale, concentration, interconnectedness, or mix of the activities of the company could pose a threat to U.S. financial stability. Once designated, a non-bank SIFI would be subject to supervision and regulation by the Federal Reserve System, including potentially capital and liquidity requirements, resolution planning, and other enhanced prudential standards. Um, the FSOC designated an insurance company and a finance company that had required federal support during the global financial crisis and then designated two insurance companies all in 2014. Uh, one of the insurance companies contested its designation and a federal court struck down the designation in 2016. And then the FSOC voted to rescind the remaining three designations in 2018. Um, in 2019, during the previous administration, FSOC adopted new guidance that would make it significantly harder to designate institutions. Among other changes, the new guidance prioritized activities-based approach over designation. And under this approach, the FSOC would examine financial products, activities, or practices, and would work with existing financial regulators to address any risks they might pose to financial stability. The FSOC would consider designating individual institutions only as a last resort after having exhausted other options. Um, earlier this year, in the current administration, um, FSOC proposed revised guidance on these determinations. And it would no longer, which would no longer require the council to use an activity-based approach. Uh, this proposal is consistent with the intent of the Dodd-Frank statute, which does not require the council to first use an activities-based approach before considering other options. It does not prior, neither does it prioritize designation over activities-based approach but instead reflects that the FSOC should be able to use any of its tools if needed so that it can respond appropriately to potential threats to financial stability. I'm just citing a quote from Secretary Yellen, who is the chair of the FSOC. When introducing this proposal, uh, she said, the council does not broadly prioritize one type of tool over another. Rather, we plainly examine a risk and we design our response to address the risk we are seeking to mitigate. Um, at the same time, to provide greater transparency about how uh, we identify and consider policies to reduce risk to financial stability, we also issued for public comment an analytic framework. And under the framework, which is familiar to many of you, um, which is about identifying vulnerabilities the council would monitor a broad range of markets, asset classes, and types of entities 
working closely with regulators to evaluate the vulnerabilities such as excessive leverage or liquidity mismatch. Having identified a significant vulnerability, the council could then work with the appropriate regulators to reduce vulnerabilities, could issue recommendations informally or formally to the primary regulators, or make use of one of its designation authorities. So in some cases, vulnerabilities arise from activities undertaken by a broad range of firms of different sizes and are most appropriately addressed through activities-based regulations. Uh, liquidity mismatch in open-end bond or loan mutual funds are good examples. Investors in bond and loan, loan open-end mutual funds can redeem funds shares daily, but the underlying bonds and loans rarely can be sold that quickly without incurring significant transaction costs, which then would be borne by the remaining investors in the fund. And so this mismatch leads to a first mover advantage and gives investors incentives to run, which can have systemic consequences, which we saw in March 2020. Um, another example, some money market funds that are generally expected to pay a fixed net asset value also face runs if they hold information sensitive assets. That is, they have, those, they have some assets with quality that can come into question in stress periods. So the FSOC, as well as the FSB, has called attention to this issue uh, repeatedly in annual reports and letters in numerous places. And in the US, in the FSOC issued a comply or explain directive to the SEC, the securities regulator, and a member of the FSOC to address the run risks in money market mutual funds. And the SEC issued new regulations. More recently, though, it became evident in March 2020 that the run incentives at the prime and tax exempt money market funds had not been fully addressed by the previous reforms and the SEC adopted new rules. And the SEC is now in the process of reviewing comments on a proposed rule aimed at reducing run incentives in open-end funds. But in other cases, individual institutions may be so large, complex, and interconnected that they require the kind of comprehensive supervision and regulation that designation would require. Currently, while no institutions are designated by the FSOC as non-bank SIFIs, FSOC under a separate authority has designated eight financial market utilities, mainly CCPs, as systemically important. And then these firms are subject to heightened prudential and supervision standards by their primary regulator and with the Federal Reserve as a secondary regulator. So the combined, this is um, this example, the analytic framework and the revised non-bank guidance should enhance the council's ability to identify and address potential systemic risks from non-bank financial intermediation. Um, let me turn to a second example, and this will be more brief, and that is macroprudential tools for systemically important banks. As you all know, um, with Basel III following the global financial crisis, there are capital surcharges for globally systemic important banks, and the CCYB was introduced um, to lean against the credit cycle. In the US, GSIBs are subject to the capital surcharge, and it varies by the bank characteristics. Um, US regulators have also adopted a counter cyclical capital buffer framework, but have held this buffer at zero since its inception. Given that the US CCYB has not changed over the business cycle, um, you might conclude that US regulators have revealed a preference for structural rather than cyclical macroprudential tools. I would say while there is some truth to this claim, um, this conclusion might be too strong because it does neglect the cyclical aspects of the domestic stress test framework, which includes a um, 
a capital analysis review, the CCAR and the Dodd-Frank stress test. And that is a key way, uh, part of the way for GSIPs and other banks that are regulated in the US. So as you know, bank stress tests can serve both microprudential and macroprudential objectives. They assess the adequacy of bank capital under certain scenarios, um, but they can also lean against the business cycle in two different ways. And I wrote a paper on this with Don Cohn um, in 2019. First, there's a way to design the scenarios so that the macroeconomic path is counter cyclical. So, um, depending on your starting position, the shock is more severe if you're in a good time and less severe when you're in bad, in a bad time, it simply said. The second way, and actually the more binding way that had had been occurring is the stress test required that banks pre-fund their shareholder distributions. That is, they required banks to hold back the capital for planned dividends and share buybacks that they plan to make over the stress period horizon. This could be as much as two percentage points of capital a year when earnings are high. So this feature naturally raises the amount of capital required in the stress test if you start from a strong position. This is to say that US banks have been subject to some countercyclical capital regulation in the US, even though the CCYB has not been activated. Um, I would note though, however, that bank regulators did change the stress testing program in 2020 in a number of ways um, to raise the minimum, but they did reduce the required pre-funding of shareholder distributions. And this, in this way, it did reduce the counter cyclicality, but there's still some remaining. Okay, my third example, um, just want to touch briefly on the implications of the banking turmoil last March, this March 2023 for macro pro policy. Um, the failure of two banks over a single weekend revealed a number of weaknesses. Uh, first, of course, it was the firm's own risk management and government pra governance practices as well as weaknesses in supervision. But a key vulnerability exposed was related to uninsured deposits and the rapid speed at which depositors could run much faster than in the past if depositors were to lose confidence in a bank. So Silicon Valley Bank had significant unrealized mark-to-market losses on government securities and what appeared to be relatively high quality mortgages, but was not able to raise new equity as it rose, wrote down those values. It lost more than $40 billion in deposits, um, which is a quarter of its deposits in one day, could have lost another 100 billion had it opened the next day. Almost 90% of its deposits were uninsured and they were highly concentrated. Signature Bank, the other bank, had a similarly high share of uninsured deposits, roughly 90%, though it was half the size of SVB. So during this episode, in my interpretation, the high share of uninsured deposits, rather than the size of the banks, was most critical for, to uh, creating contagion. And authorities were concerned that runs at even small banks much smaller banks could spread more broadly in this situation. And so to reduce the risk of deposit runs from other banks that had similar business models, uh, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, and Treasury invoked what is called a systemic risk exception to stem the system-wide runs on uninsured depositors by protecting the uninsured depositors at the two failed banks. And at the same time, the Federal Reserve established a program so that banks, sound banks, could liquefy their treasury and agency securities. And these decisions were made not because the troubled banks were too big to fail, in fact, they did fail, but to prevent broader contagion from uninsured deposits. <clears throat> 
So these events, in my view, suggest regulators need to be looking at the existing macro pro toolkit, whether it's sufficient for the management of systemic liquidity, which Klaus referred to earlier. Are there new liquidity management tools that could be put in place to prepare for runs that are extremely rapid um, on uninsured deposits? Um, are there operational changes that could be made at a central bank to increase the timeliness of the provision of central bank liquidity? And these questions, I believe, are not just for the U.S., but also for banking sectors globally. And this is on the FSB uh, SCAB agenda, FSB more broadly, and the stand other standard setters. So I opened these, uh, the, my remarks this morning by just saying that macroprudential regulators need to be flexible, adaptive, creative in responding to different situations. Um, there's a number of tools. I tried to illustrate a few on how they can be applied. This diversity of tools, just a caveat, the diversity of tools and the applications raise some important challenges for studying the effectiveness of macro pro tools and promoting greater and more intentional use. I think research on this is critically important. We do need to study are they having their, their effect, how they can be used. The diversity makes it harder, but I really hope the researchers in this room will continue to pursue this important area of study. Okay, with that, I will stop. There, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Nelly. Uh, Vas Maduros is uh, next up. Uh, thanks uh, very much, Erland, and uh, thank you so much for, well, to colleagues from the ECB and the IMF for organizing this event. Really delighted uh, to be here today. And I've looked at the full program, it looks great, including some of the papers that we're going to be discussing. Um, uh, so I was thinking of, uh, I mean, in Ireland, we've, um, we've uh, really invested in both developing the macro potential framework and then also implement it, but also more recently reviewing elements of it as we've gained more experience from uh, ourselves and also other jurisdictions. So I thought I might start by um, looking back uh, a little bit and then focus on some of the more forward-looking uh, dimensions. And of course, uh, I will be focusing very much on the, on the Irish experience. So starting with a backward-looking perspective, I mean, I think at a high level for me, I'd be a relatively a little bit more positive than uh, I think uh, David was in the previous session. Because if we take a step back, uh, I think there has been meaningful progress in both building the frameworks and then the implementation uh, of them. It has been only 15 years since the height of the global financial crisis, which of course laid bare the kind of um, fault lines in the overall macro stabilization framework, right? Because you had central banks focusing on price stability on the one hand, you had supervision regulation focusing on the safety and soundness of individual institutions, and then you had this gap in the middle on the on the interaction between macro, the macro economy and finance. And, and that's where macroprudential uh, policy filled that gap. But 15 years ago, it was far from clear that we would end up where we are now. I mean, I remember some of the early discussions about developing a macroprudential perspective in regulation. And at the time, it seemed quite distant and also quite conceptual. Uh, and even some of the early Basel committee discussions about macroprudential tools like the countercyclical capital buffer or buffer for systemically important institutions, that it wasn't certain whether they would be agreed or, or then uh, implemented. So if you look at where we are now at the, at the global and the European level, we have legislative frameworks in place uh, that give authorities specific macroprudential powers. We have institutional frameworks in place in, in Europe with the European Systemic Risk Board and, of course, the national macroprudential authorities, of which the Central Bank of Ireland is one. We've seen increased use of tools, whether it is capital-based tools or borrower-based measures, but, of course, there are differences across, across experiences. And we've seen more uh, analysis on understanding the effects of these policies. Now, turning a little bit to our own experience uh, in Ireland, as I've mentioned, we have been active in both developing the framework and implementing it. 
Now, to some extent, this reflects what was a very painful experience in Ireland during the financial crisis, which demonstrated uh, the costs of financial instability on society, which were large and very persistent. And another way of putting it demonstrated the costs of not taking action in the period before to safeguard resilience. But there is a broader, a broader dimension as well. Ireland is a small, open, highly globalized economy, and it's also within a monetary union. So when you think of macroprudential policy, I mean, for us, it's one of the key macro stabilization levers when we think about guarding against risks stemming from macro financial imbalances. And our approach has evolved over time, of course. We've learned lessons. Uh, we've learned lessons from our own experience, lessons from other experience. And where we are now is we think of our macroprudential framework as consisting of three broad pillars. Measures related to banks, measures related to borrowers, and measures related to non-banks. So in banks, of course, it's mainly around bank capital. Uh, and we've introduced the counter-cyclical capital buffer and similar to our colleagues in the Netherlands. We've set a 1.5% CCYB rate for when risks are neither elevated nor subdued. And we've also used uh, buffers for systemically important institutions to deal with the distribution of risk around, around the banking system. On borrowers, uh, we've introduced measures to limit the share of new lending at high levels of indebtedness, high loan-to-income multiples, and high loan-to-value uh, ratios. And the non-banks, and I'll come back to this, is an area that is uh, one we're increasingly uh, focused on. We've introduced some uh, measures, but this is an area we're heavily invested on with colleagues internationally. And I think I would say, at least in Ireland, these have made a material uh, difference to macrofinancial outcomes. And I think take the mortgage measures as, the, as probably the most important example. They have been key in ensuring sustainable lending standards in the mortgage market in Ireland. So just to give you one example, in the five years to 2007, around half of new mortgage lending was done at loan to income multiples greater than four. If you look at the same share in the five years to now, it's around 6%. So the, 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 um, the kind of tale of uh, high indebtedness uh, and the kind of it's, lending standards are a lot more sustainable uh, than they were in the run-up uh, to the financial crisis. And this does mean that the household sector now, with inflation high, the cost of living uh, putting pressures on household budgets, and of course interest rates rising to ensure that inflation goes back to target, the household sector now is in a more resilient position to absorb these interest rate uh, increases. Uh, than it would have been in the absence of these measures. And a lot of our analysis, which of course is very challenging, is what might have happened in the absence of these measures and counterfactuals. So looking back, I would say has been uh, a lot achieved, but of course, as a number of others have mentioned, macroprudential policy is a young discipline, so there is further to go. So let me turn to the two forward-looking dimensions now, and I'll focus on uh, deepening our analytical frameworks, First, so uh, really delighted that we're having this conference because uh, it's a key element of it. And the second one uh, that others uh, have also mentioned is ensuring that the macroprudential framework evolves in line with the evolution of the financial system. So in analytical frameworks, um, because it is a younger discipline, it is, I think, particularly critical that we continue to invest in the analytical, analytical underpinnings of macroprudential policy. And, and it is hard, right, compared to other macro policy frameworks like monetary policy or fiscal policy, because uh, macroprudential policy deals with tail risks and tries to measure tail risk. I mean, it's hard enough to forecast the central case. We have to do this uh, for uh, the evolution of tail risks. There's no clear observable um, measure of our ultimate target. Uh, and uh, as going back to what I was just saying now, the benefits of macroprudential policy are difficult to measure. They're really unobserved, certainly in, in good times. But the cost can be more visible. So it is difficult, uh, but it's no less critical. So let me, let me outline three areas of focus, at least from a policy perspective, that I think it's important that we collectively continue to make uh, progress on. The first one is around risk assessment. 
uh, and analytical tools that help inform what I think have to be forward-looking judgments around uh, the evolution of the risk environment and then also the resilience of the financial system to these tail uh, risks. And the reason why I think it's critical is because it has to be forward-looking if we want policy to be effective because there are lags and it, has also, uh, it needs to also be done in a kind of systematic uh, manner. The second area is around uh, analytical frameworks and models to help inform uh, policy judgments around the benefits and the costs of different macroprudential interventions. Because, you know, like all policy interventions, macroprudential policy entails both benefits and costs for the economy as a whole. Uh, and macroprudential authorities, of course, do not aim for resilience at any cost. That wouldn't serve society well. Uh, and again, there's areas that we've made more progress on. I think bank capital tools we've made more progress on collectively. But in, in the area of borrower-based measures, I mean, we did some uh, work to try and progress this as part of our recent framework review, but it's an area where I think a lot more uh, can be done. And then finally, the third one is around the broad area of macroprudential strategy. So Nelly was saying that there are so many different tools. How do the tools interact between them? How does macroprudential policy interact with other policy frameworks like monetary policy? What are, when we think about structural characteristics of economies or financial sectors, how should these affect our macroprudential stance? So, to get towards kind of maturity of macroprudential frameworks, research and deepening these analytical underpinnings will be critical, uh, which, is, as I said, I'm delighted that we're having conferences like this to share our collective learnings. And there's also a responsibility on, on us uh, to kind of share our data and our information and our experience and also being clear about what our peak policy agenda questions are. So then let me turn to, this, to the second forward-looking priority, which is around the evolution of the financial sector. Uh, and you know, the structure of the financial system is dynamic, it's not static. And for any type of regulation to be effective, including macroprudential regulation, it also needs to be dynamic. If regulation is static, it won't be effective. Now, a key dimension in that respect, and the one I'll focus on, is around the growth of non-bank financial intermediation uh, that uh, both Klaas and Nelly mentioned already. I mean, you all know that since the global financial crisis, there's been this growth in market-based finance, uh, including uh, driven by investment funds. And you see this in so many different dimensions now, right? You see this in terms of the share of financing of companies, uh, the share of financing of commercial real estate markets, the share of financing of cross-border capital flows to emerging markets. You see this uh, becoming increasingly relevant for different dimensions of the global economy. And there are real benefits of, of a more diversified financial system. Uh, but for those benefits to be, uh, to be realized, of course, you need this form of financial intermediation to be resilient uh, to shocks. And we've seen episodes, uh, as Klaas and Nell mentioned recently, where this hasn't been the case, and vulnerabilities in the non-bank sector, the investment fund sector, uh, contributed to amplifying some of the stresses that we saw there in broader markets. Dash for cash, the UK mark guild market disruption last year, and the, low the role of LDI funds. And this is why the kind of regulatory framework for the sector needs to evolve. Because so far, the framework has largely, not entirely, but largely, developed with an investor protection perspective in mind, which, of course, is and remains a critical perspective. But the sector now matters for the rest of the financial system and the rest of the economy. And this is the kind of macroprudential perspective uh, and the evolution uh, that, that I think is important that we see uh, in the global regulatory framework. This has been and will continue to be a key priority for us at the Central Bank. Uh, we have a large internationally focused investment fund sector in Ireland. We have taken steps already. So we have introduced macroprudential uh, measures to safeguard the resilience of, uh, of property funds. Property funds in Ireland now account for around 30 to 35 percent of the stock of commercial real estate. So if, uh, if this source of financial intermediation were not resilient, it could affect the functioning of the market. Uh, on the back of the LDI episode last year, we, working with colleagues across Europe, introduced supervisory interventions 
around um, expectations for resilient standards for LDI funds. We have been and will continue working with our colleagues internationally at the FSB and IOSCO uh, on, uh, on the broad agenda about strengthening resilience of NBFIs, uh, including uh, OEFs and, and NBFI leverage. And in that context, we also recently published a, a discussion paper that seeks to set out how can we collectively develop a overarching framework that has this macroprudential perspective in the regulation of the investment fund sector. And that seeks to consider what might the objectives of such a framework be, or some of the principles that might underpin its design, uh, what are some of the potential tools that could be used, whether uh, existing or, or repurposing, uh, to achieve those objectives, and also operational dimensions of it, including, of course, uh, data issues, which are uh, critical in data sharing, which is also an important dimension of that. It will be a multi-year agenda, and it will require significant global and European cooperation, but it's also a critical agenda, because going back to where I started, the financial system is evolving, and it will be important that the regulatory approach evolves with it. So I'll finish off here. I'm sure we'll cover much more of this during the discussion, but in summary, a significant progress to date, but there is still uh, a relatively young discipline and plenty of, for us to focus on collectively towards maturing uh, the framework. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, uh, Vas. Um, Tobias, uh, it's time for you to come in. Try this again. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Um, yes, okay, perfect. So um, let, me, let me apologize for not being there in person. I have been looking forward to attending uh, this workshop in person, but my uh, father-in-law passed away unexpectedly, so I have to. Uh, I had to come back to to Washington uh, for the funeral, and let me thank uh, so much the the uh, two speakers who who could make it uh, in in person, uh, class and Vasilios. Um, so um, I uh, don't have prepared remarks, but I do have uh, a slide deck. Um, so I'm going to try uh, to share this now. Uh, I hope that uh, you can see my slides. Is that um, can you can you see the slides? Yes. Okay, I see it. Okay, perfect. So, um, uh, I thought I, I'd take a little bit more of a, of a broader cross-country perspective and and also speak to emerging markets and small open economies. Um, you know, which is somewhat complementary to to the previous uh, speakers. Um, so. Uh, you know, the current conjuncture uh, is, is one where macroprudential pools have been strengthen, strengthened, as, as we have heard from, from all three speakers. Uh, but of course, we are in a, in a, in a pretty um, uh, unusual uh, macro environment uh, where interest rates have, have risen uh, dramatically. Uh, and that's even more dramatic in emerging markets than in the euro area or, or the US. So the, the chart on the left shows you uh, the, the rate paths. And you can see in Latin America, for example, on average, interest rates have risen uh, by over 10 percentage points, right? Um, so in the US, it's about 5 percent, euro area about 4 percent. But in, in, in emerging markets, Latin America, but also in Eastern Europe, uh, you know, interest rates have gone up uh, much more dramatically. And uh, I, I would argue that it's quite impressive uh, how much financial stability we have seen in this environment. Uh, of course, with uh, the exception of uh, the US turmoil that Nelly had mentioned, um, and I would also say the, uh, the NBFI uh, turmoil last October uh, in the UK. Um, so, uh, of course, um, you know, prudential standards are, are much, uh, much tighter. Uh, so this chart shows you, uh, for example, for uh, emerging markets, uh, you know, uh, the uh, capital levels um, and, uh, you know, they have gone up quite dramatically. Uh, in advancing economies, they have gone up proportionally even, even more than in emerging markets. Um, and uh, liquidity requirements have also been strengthened, governance has been strengthened, uh, and of course, stress testing is now deployed all over the world in advanced economies and in emerging markets. 
uh, in stress testing is, is primarily solvency stress testing, uh, but uh, is also uh, oftentimes focused on liquidity as well as bank and non-bank interactions. So this is certainly a work in progress. Uh, but uh, as a as a supervisory approach, uh, you know, stress testing has really uh, become uh, very important. Now uh, we have done quite a bit of work, um, and so this includes Erland, who who uh, has agreed to step in uh, to to moderate the panel. Um, Erland and other uh, colleagues here uh, at the IMF, as well as at BIS and and other institutions, have sort of looked to evaluate um, the uh, effectiveness of macroprudential policy. And uh, I would argue that perhaps the most compelling uh, evidence is. Uh, you know, by looking at the downside risks to GDP. So this is very much related to work that I did with Nelly and uh, former colleagues uh, from the New York Fed as well, you know, on, on growth and risk. So understanding sort of like the, the downside of the forecast distribution as a function of financial variables. And um, so the IMF uh, colleagues, um, uh, so there's a very nice paper by Brandau and, 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 uh, and others, uh, they, as well as the earlier work by, by Erland, um, you know, are looking to what extent, so like the, the usage of macroprudential policy is mitigating downside risks. And so this is using sort of like panel uh, data across countries using the macroprudential policy uh, database uh, that we're collecting here at the at the fund, and the right chart gives you you know one indication, and and there are other studies like that that sort of show that there's less downside risk, so there's less growth at risk uh, when you have a macroprudential tools. So I, I think this goes in the right direction, you know, as uh, as was uh, indicated earlier, it is hard to measure sort of like the outcome of macroprudential tools, but with this cross country approach and this sort of like you know, growth at risk, which is kind of like density forecasting, you can sort of show that, you know, the GDP forecast distribution, the lower tail is, is, is less, uh, uh, less pronounced uh, with micro pro. I think that's a, that's a reassuring uh, finding. At the same time, there is quite a bit of evidence uh, that, you know, the, the magnitudes really matter. And, um, you know, um, Systemic risk and financial crisis are inherently about nonlinearities, uh, and so having uh, not enough uh, firepower can be problematic. Um, so here, uh, I'm showing, uh, for example, uh, also from a paper by by Erland, a uh, mortgage default rates uh, rising nonlinearly with a debt service. So you know, if you use these borrower-based tools. Uh, but you don't have enough, you, you, you may actually miss uh, the nonlinear amplification. So having, having a, a rigorous quantitative framework to understand how much is the right amount uh, is certainly work in progress. And given the, uh, you know, the only now emerging evidence, uh, this calibration is, is certainly work in progress. Um, so this was my backward looking part. So let me come to the forward looking part. So I thought I would um, focus a little bit more on, on the inflation environment in the post GFC world, so to say. Um, so we have certainly seen a, a world with more shocks in the, in the past four years, and we may see more shocks. You know, there's a lot of uh, hope uh, and, and the central forecast is one where inflation is coming back down in the major uh, advanced economies such as the euro area and the us but also around emerging markets in fact the emerging markets have already seen uh central bank uh, easing easing monetary policy uh, as inflation has has moved in the right direction but of course uh, there's a lot of risk around that and we can't exclude that inflation may flare up again may be more persistent and um, you know, outside of the baseline, there's certainly the risk of, of uh, a need for further tightening. Um, and um, you know, this kind of um, you know risk to inflation may be something that that could persist. Um, we don't know for sure, but um, you know, rates are certainly indicating that there could be uh, more inflation risk uh, going forward. There could be more volatility in supply shocks, commodities, but also supply chains. 
um, you know, there's a, a lot more um, uh, geopolitical risk. Um, you know, the the current inflation and, and disinflation episode is uh, pointing towards nonlinearity in the Phillips curve, which could be triggered again on the way up and the way down. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, there, there could be uh, uh, financial stability risks uh, triggered uh, from persistent uh, inflation. Um, so, uh, you know, historically, it's certainly the case that uh, financial crises are oftentimes preceded by monetary tightening. Um, and, uh, you know, when you look at bank balance sheets, but also non-bank balance sheets, there's substantial amount of duration risk, uh, you know, everywhere. Um, and so uh, tighter monetary policy and, and especially sudden tightening of monetary policy could trigger uh, sudden valuation losses. Um, the most dramatic uh, uh, illustration of that is, of course, the LDI episode in the UK last year. Um, uh, but, of, but the SVB episode is also an example where, you know, the, the, the uh, supplies and the up, to the upside of inflation and then a shift in the, in the yield curve, you know, triggered the stress in, in a number of institutions. And SVB was sort of like the furthest in the tail here. Um, but, you know, if we look, you know, in the GFSR that came out last week, we look at sort of like a severe stress scenario uh, uh, around the world, around 29 countries, including Euro area countries, uh, US and many emerging markets. And when you put in the, you know, on top of this very sharp rise in interest rates, if you put a, a, a severe stagflationary uh, example on top of that, we do see quite a bit of weakness in the banking system as well. So a weak tail of banks that would be exposed uh, to the stress of, uh, you know, higher for longer and uh, associated with a, with a global recession. And so while uh, I fully concur that, uh, you know, you, you, you want to aim at fully divorcing financial stability from monetary policy and you want to, you know, develop uh, all the, Microprudential tools to achieve that divorce, you know, given any level of prudential policy, you know, you may still encounter um, trade offs at some point, right? And you may fix that afterwards by tightening. Uh, but, you know, we are not certain that uh, prudential policy is, is tight enough to withstand any rise in interest rates. Um, and that, again, uh, we saw very much uh, uh, this year. Um, and so there could be unpleasant trade-offs, uh, unfortunately, even though we aim to not have those trade-offs, uh, those trade-offs uh, could, uh, you know, could occur. So at the moment here at the fund, we're doing uh, sort of like work um, uh, based on uh, a blog that I put out with, with Gita and, and Pierre Olivier um, earlier this year, uh, and that really goes back also again to work with, with Nelly some, some years ago on how to think about sort of like monetary policy and, and financial stability. And I think that, um, uh, you know, one, so there are two sort of like broad things. So one thing is ex ante regulation. So the more buffers there are, uh, the less likely the financial system will end up in a, in a stressed situation. And then there are the exposed tools, which are essentially liquidity provision tools. Um, and uh, the systemic risk exemption that was deployed in the US was already mentioned. You know, this is, for example, not available everywhere. For example, in European countries, there's, there's no systemic risk exemption. Now, of course, you know, European banks are, are, are perhaps uh, regulated more strongly than those regional banks were in the US. But then again, it's hard to exclude that there wouldn't be at some point such a tail event uh, where uh, such so like uh, liquidity spillovers could be necessary. So, you know, the fund had always argued that uh, systemic risk exemptions would actually be a quite sensible uh, addition to the emergency uh, uh, liquidity toolkit. Um, and, um, you know, how aggressive the discount window can be landing is also quite different across different countries. So, you know, what can be done by the discount window? So the kind of emergency facilities uh, that, for example, the Federal Reserve put out in March, 
would also not be possible necessarily in other countries. So I think that um, you know, what we may find is that prudential tools may not be sufficient ex ante and crisis management tools, even though they were sufficient in, in the UK last year and this year, they may not be sufficient in some cases. Um, and at that point, uh, central banks could be caught in this unpleasant trade-offs. Um, um, you know, you know, having to so like a trade off between um, um, inflation goals and, and financial stability goals. Now, for emerging markets, the situation is even worse because when you have a, a, a fiscal dominance problem, right? I mean, then easing monetary policy in the face of financial stability problems could create even more, uh, 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 you know, more problems down the road and, and undermine credibility. So they can't even have that trade off in, in some sense. So, you know, there's really no tool left. Um, and, um, you know, you have to go for the financial instability, raise rates, even if it, um, you know, impacts your, your uh, domestic financial sector, you know, significantly. So, so it's even more unpleasant when you have fiscal dominance problems or credibility problems. Um, so I think the punchline, and this is my last slide, is uh, that, um, you know, having sufficient ex ante buffers is, is very much first order, and using uh, counter cyclical buffers uh, in, a, in a proactive manner uh, so that you don't have to face these trade-offs when back chocks hit. I think that, that is one of the major lessons, um, you know, it's hard to imagine that we will we will ever be at the place where we are insured against all shocks, uh, but certainly um, you know the direction of travel is to is to keep moving, uh, to fix any gaps, uh, use cyclical tools um, to to complement the the more structural uh, measures, deploy liquidity emergency tools uh, to both banks and non banks. Uh, to act uh, 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 exposed, but you know, uh, still uh, you may end up with with some unpleasant trade-offs. So let me stop here and, and turn back to to Erland. Great, uh, thanks, uh, thanks to Um Yeah, I thought uh, perhaps I'll um, uh, throw a, a question uh, uh, to the panelists, which uh, goes back to the um, you know challenges that we've been you know accustomed to um in trying to regulate uh, banks and borrowers we we um just heard from um, you know the, the discussion in the in the previous session that it was important to re regulate leverage um now the question is do you uh, regulate the leverage of the banks uh, or do you leverage uh, regulate the leverage of the borrowers do you do you need to do both uh, to achieve the first best, uh, what if regulating the leverage of borrowers is harder to do? Uh, perhaps for political economy reasons, perhaps you, because you don't have the mandate to do it. Um, what are the implications of that? Do you then try and compensate by uh, regulating bank leverage, or perhaps even more, uh, raising capital levels, perhaps uh, even more, uh, and if so, uh, is that is that effective, or do we need to worry that we're going to have even more of a leakage uh, towards uh, provision of credit by by non banks? Um, perhaps uh, it's a question I'd, I'd like to ask. Uh, perhaps uh, class uh, to to come in on and and and, and Vas, who uh, who I think also has a has a good experience with the uh, with with Ireland. Well, thank you. I think this is, of course, an excellent question. And I, I briefly touched upon it when I uh, mentioned the fact that as a macroprudential authority, usually you have leverage over bank leverage, but you don't have much leverage over household and corporate, let alone public sector leverage. Um, I mean, it's a given that in all of our tax assist systems, we have tax deductibility of uh, uh, interest expenses. So the tax system clearly prefer, uh, uh, yeah, has a preferential treatment for debt over equity when it comes to the corporate sector, 
um, well, in countries like mine, unfortunately, yeah, there's still interest rate tax deductibility also for mortgage holders. Um, so there are forces that are clearly working against containing leverage uh, at the uh, at the borrowers. Um, and although in my country we've had a fierce debate after uh, the global financial crisis of tightening uh, loan to value standards, loan to income, loan to value standards, and we made progress. Let that um, not be any uh, mistake about it. But we didn't make as much progress as we would have preferred. I mean, we made progress in the sense that the maximum uh, loan to value limit now in the Netherlands is 100%. <laughs> It used to be between 120 and 130, and so there was an addition, a lot of additional borrowing taking place. Now, this sounds, of course, very crazy, uh, and it is, <laughs> it was. Um, but of course, you also have to keep in mind we have a fully funded pension system. So, uh, uh, if you work five days a week, roughly one day a week, you already work for your pension, which means that uh, saving out of your current income to make a down payment, for instance, for your first house is pretty tough if you already have mandatory saving of 20% of, of your income for your pension. So the fact that we have high loan to value, higher loan to value ratios, uh, I mean, to some extent is a flip side of uh, the whole financial structure, in, including having this, uh, this fully funded pension system. Um, but of course, clearly, uh, we would have preferred uh, to go down to, let's say, 90% of, uh, of loan to value. Now, we did get a a mandatory amortization requirement, which we also didn't have before 2013. Um, so the situation is now much better, I would argue, and that also shows uh, for stress tests, 2008-2013, no less than one out of three mortgages was underwater in the Netherlands, 33%. If we did a similar stress test, so we uh, simulated a similar decline in house prices than we had between 2008 and 2013, then now roughly 8% of our mortgages would be underwater. So that is progress, I think. Um, but we have come to acknowledge that in terms of pushing the government uh, to restricting loan to value, loan to income, we've probably reached the limit of what they find acceptable. Uh, uh, if you were to restrict it further, uh, you, you, you get into discussions of uh, young couples uh, denying young couples access to the housing market, uh, which uh, politically is quite fraught. So, yes, at some point we have concluded, OK, this is as far as we can get with borrower based measures. But then we have to make sure that at least we try to isolate the financial sector as much as possible from the swings in the housing market that will inevitable inevitably be the consequences of these uh, the, these policy preferences in uh, in my country and that is why we've been not only active in activating the counter cyclical buffer but we also introduced a risk rate floor on uh, on mortgages over and above uh, the the basel international framework now the basel framework the basel 3 will uh, greatly increase risk rates on mortgages but unfortunately, implementation in the EU has been postponed quite a bit uh, until uh, 27 to 32, 2027 to 2032. And we didn't want to await that increase in risk rates. And that's why we unilaterally uh, introduced a risk rate floor on mortgages to already pull forward uh, these higher risk rates uh, that, that would normally come if there was a uh, full implementation of, uh, of the Basel III requirement. So yes, there was some overcompensation in short of the fact that we had to accept the limits of, uh, of what we could do on, uh, on getting the governments to move on, on borrower-based measures. Uh, thanks very much. So, I mean, this ultimately goes to the question of the interaction between tools, right? And, and, uh, and we've, we've, thought, uh, we've thought about this a lot. And I mean, ultimately, there are interactions between capital-based tools and, and borrower-based measures. Uh, but we do see them as complementary uh, interventions because, I mean, we always start by kind of thinking what is the friction or externality or the risk that we're trying to address. Uh, and there is a lot of evidence that this rapid growth in indebtedness is followed by both financial uh, stresses uh, and also deeper uh, recessions, this over indebtedness uh, channel, uh, which has macroeconomic effects. Uh, and of course, this can be uh, at its heart because of unsustainable lending standards, which feed this cycle between credit and house prices. And you see this in unsustainable growth in, in indebtedness. Um, so one response to that uh, could be uh, 
uh, raise more capital or raise capital buffers, uh, which of course will give you resilience of lenders. But in and of itself, uh, that might that would not guard against the indebtedness uh, over indebtedness externalities and these big cuts in spending that you see in periods of stress, which have broader macroeconomic effects and ultimately damaging for everyone. So we do see these as uh, as complementary, but they do interact, right? They even interact uh, mechanically. So I mean, we have seen in, in Ireland that the risk weights on loans that have been issued under the mortgage measure, which are under much more sustainable lending standards, have lower risk weights than those that were issued before uh, the financial crisis under under uh, under uh, IRB models. So there's also a mechanical interaction between them, but we see them as, as complementary. Okay. Um, <clears throat> perhaps um, uh, then, then uh, uh, I'm not sure whether Nelly or, or Tobias want to come in on, on, on this question. If not, um, I would... Um, I would perhaps um, um, take it to the um, frontier issues also to, to some extent. And there I, I did uh, want to um, uh, ask Nelly and, and perhaps starting with Nelly and, and Vas because um, on the non-bank financial uh, institutions, um, both of you mentioned that you had taken essentially uh, domestic action. So the um, actions that were taken in response to the FSOC's recommendations on the money market funds were a domestic uh, initiative. Uh, and I think also, uh, uh, Vas, uh, the um, regulations that you have done recently uh, trying to regulate leverage of property funds, something that you've done domestically. Um, so to both of you, the question of um, you know how how um, what's the what's the boundary of that or what's the limit of that uh, domestic action in in the space of NBFIs uh, and um, where then do we need the you know do we need uh, the international agreements to come in uh, perhaps at the FSB uh, level uh, and that of course is also something that uh, uh, perhaps class uh, can give. Uh, his uh, his perspective on. Um, thanks, Erlen. Maybe I could start. Um, can I just start by commenting, making a comment on your previous question, just to add a bit of um, pragmatism to the question as, as opposed to conceptual. I think there is a broad issue of, you know, thinking about applying capital or LTVs as the tool, it's just how easily is it for activities to migrate out of the banking system to uh, the non-bank system? And that varies quite a bit. Um, outside of residential mortgages in, in the US, for example, for commercial real estate, half of the debt, the loans outstanding are in non-banks and half of it is at banks. So, one might have to absolutely think about that differently. Um, and so I just do, just to, um, and then the other piece, the pragmatic piece is what actual tools exist in your country that you can implement. Um, a broad widespread LTV is not easily done, would need to be, um, negotiated among many, many regulators to, to implement. So those are issues I think that come up aside from like conceptually, which one are we gonna be able to get? Um, on the NBFI question you just raised, uh, we did for money market funds. I think that is an action that um, domestic is useful and, and probably, you know, gets most of the resilience needed for the US. I'm not sure, and others in the panel and in the audience would know more about the European money market funds. I think there are some ser some significant cross-border concerns. As I understand it, for example, um, many of the, um, the UK money market funds are domiciled in other parts of Europe 
Um, so a domestic action would not uh, necessarily um, be as helpful. And so in that case, FSB principles and guidelines are extremely helpful. Um, Klaus mentioned earlier um, money market funds and trying to close liquidity mismatches and open end funds um, are two of the priorities for FSB right now. Just I'll stop there. Uh, yeah, just very briefly on this, I mean, I think I would say that the, the certainly my starting point is that the, it, it, it does need to be globally coordinated as a starting point. I mean, uh, capital markets are inherently global and uh, it is going to be very difficult to have something effective unless you have global coordination. Hence why a lot of the work of the FSP that um, Klaus will cover in our own focus is very much in engaging with this work because it, it will start at a global level, FSP level, then it would translate into kind of European frameworks and then domestic frameworks. Uh, the, the, the LDI fund example that I mentioned which was a supervisory intervention, even that was coordinated with other authorities uh, in Europe because we did see actually that in terms of the location of uh, the, the LDI funds that were investing in the UK guild market was a small number of jurisdictions, but again, coordination was really important uh, because otherwise the, the risks being ineffective. Uh, property funds was a little bit different because there we looked at the structure of financing of the commercial real estate uh, market in Ireland. We did see the significant growth in investment uh, fund financing of CRE, and we kind of did a deep dive, and as I mentioned earlier, they are kind of big proportion of the stock now. So this is an area where we, um, we, we did introduce measures. But in Europe, we also have a um, kind of, it's not, we don't have a reciprocation framework yet, but we have structures that if we were to observe leakages, we could uh, look into this and engage with uh, supervisors abroad. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's good to keep in mind that there are still uh, important differences uh, between uh, banks and non-banks and also in the way they are uh, being, uh, be, being supervised. Um, I mentioned already, uh, you have to walk before you run. If you want to think about uh, a good macro prudential framework for NBFI, you first need to have a good micro prudential foundation to build upon. But bank supervisors, always have had a, a, a logical and a good sort of sense for what financial stability means because typically yeah, banking crises have often been systemic etc so bank supervision supervisors think in terms of prudential uh, requirements think in terms of systemic risk etc the security market overseers community does not immediately have that mindset that they have a mindset of investor protection but that's not necessarily the same eh, as financial stability. So what, what I think we still need in that eh, uh, area, we, first we need better micro, foundation, micro prudential foundations, so more robustness and resilience within individual entities of the system. We need the supervisors to also not only trigger uh, their supervisory tools when investor protection is at stake, but also possibly from uh, uh, a more systemic wide perspective when there are financial stability risks uh, originating systemic liquidity crisis uh, being built in uh, in the sector. And that means that we're not yet at the, uh, we're far off, I would even say relatively far from the level of advancedness uh, that, that I think uh, we've been trying to build over the last 15 years on the banking side. Many of the tools are there and we know them. Uh, think about redemption gates, swing pricing on the liability side, asset bucketing uh, on the asset side. So it's not that the tools are not well known, but I think these are all used only in the context of investor protection. And what we have to get the supervisory community uh, to move in the direction that these tools should actually also be used when there is systemic risk uh, building on the horizon. So that's what I call repurposing of uh, of existing tools now is that enough i don't know but at least eh, we first have to make that step and then in the second step we may want to think okay do we also eh, see any potential for developing separate macro prudential tools which don't build up uh, build off the micro prudential which are not simply eh, uh, an elevation of the micro prudential 
instrument. And on that one, of course, we need to be open-minded. But I must also say that if someone makes the case to me that we need to have separate macro credential tools and say, okay, what are you thinking? Uh, what, 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 what kind of tools are you thinking about? I don't get a very sort of convincing answer yet. So uh, I, of course we need to be open-minded, we need to be agile, but I think most of the potential lies in first strengthening the resilience within uh, the individual entities. And then secondly, bringing this financial st uh, stability perspective into repurposing some of these tools. Great. Um, thanks for those uh, answers. Uh, time is time is running fast. Uh, we we are <laughs> we covered NBFIs to some extent. We haven't even touched uh, crypto and climate, even though class you you uh, you mentioned those uh, areas uh, in your initial uh, remarks. I th I think given that we only have uh, seven minutes. Uh, left in the in the program, perhaps we'll turn uh, to the audience uh, as well and see uh, whether there are questions for the for the panelists. Okay, perhaps wait for the uh, microphone and then uh, just identify yourself uh, before you ask the question. Uh Thank you, yeah, Alastair on Bank of America. So just, just on NBFIs again, please. So the Central Bank of Ireland has now 18 things it looks at. And when judging its counter-cyclical buffer, I think the Nederlander Bank's got 26, right? So you've it's extremely well advanced. And as you've said, class, you know, you're already in the point of putting bank capital for not bank capital things, really. The fact that LTVs are higher than you'd like in the system elsewhere. The NBFI, it's very conceptual still where you're going with that. I mean, how long do you give yourselves? If you, you've made this much progress, it's taken 15 years in banks. Let's assume that's broadly done. What, what's, the, what's a good time frame? Because it feels like it could be fairly pressing now. The LDI certainly was in the UK. You know, it was only fixed by bringing down the government. So it's quite, quite a big deal at the time. Thank you. I mean... We live in democracies, uh, luckily so, <laughs> but that means, of course, that we, uh, from the FBI, uh, from the FSB side, uh, we can sort of issue and develop global standards. Then usually, of course, these standards need to be translated also by the sectoral standard setting bodies, and then they need to feed into legislative processes in our jurisdictions on which the political uh, system has an impact. And that's why I say we live in uh, democracies. <laughs> So what we are trying to do on the FSB side is to speed up yeah, our sort of uh, our phase in this, yeah, coming up with recommendations as much as we can. So we have issued strengthened recommendations on money market funds, which are now to be implemented. The US is close to implementation. All the jurisdictions are close to implementation. Unfortunately, in Europe, we will have uh, elections. So yeah, the commission has decided to relegate this to the next commission which is the type of delay that unfortunately yeah, is a fact of life that we can, can, can't do much about. On open-ended funds, we are now in the process of finalizing the recommendations. We issued uh, re uh, recommendations for consultations earlier this year. Consultation and responses have come in, and we're now in the process of finalizing it. But then, of course, also these uh, need to be adopted. We work in conjunction, uh, in cooperation with IOSCO, the, uh, the sectoral uh, standard setter there. But then again, they need to be uh, implemented in the national legislative processes, uh, uh, which will take uh, a little bit of uh, a little bit of time. And I didn't even talk about uh, so much about uh, margin uh, uh, liquidity preparedness uh, for higher margin requirements and the important work that we still need to do on uh, better detecting these pockets of hidden leverage, because that continues to be a problem in the NBFI sector. All the uh, the instances that I also mentioned in my uh, introductory words, uh, they all had one element in common. All of a sudden, there was leverage popping up somewhere where we had not spotted it uh, it before. So that is work that where we are still uh, uh, on the ball. Uh, that's for 2024. Actually, Nelly uh, is going to lead that uh, that work. That will then also have to lead to recommendations. Yeah, and then th that all needs to be implemented. So a couple of years is is the bare minimum that processes like this uh, this will take. Unfortunately, it is what it is. But that's, uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's a worthwhile price uh, when you cherish living in a democracy like I do.
<laughs> yes, uh, Pablo de Castro, no just bank investment management. Uh, it, it feels there's a willingness to take uh, more frequent, uh, so make more frequent macro prudential adjustments. And, and the feeling is that um, from the point of view of the market, we, we already live in a world in this, which we, we're seeing relatively frequent changes in regulation. So the goalposts seem to, seem to change with relative frequency. Uh, have you got the feeling that that increases the cost of equity for banks to the extent that it becomes bank equity becomes an asset class in which you are not sure exactly what you are buying because the rules of the game change with relative fre frequency and the question is to, at what stage does that become a problem thank you uh, i can pick that up so um i mean i think t t two thoughts maybe so one is uh there is the these are relatively young and new frameworks so i think part at least in our experience part of the the changes that we've made have been because we, you know we wanted to review them which is good practice in policy making uh, and to be thinking about what we've learned over time and what uh, adjustments do we need uh, to make so over time as these frameworks mature they should become more systematic uh, hopefully in some of these uh, adjustments because of we are learning and we need to be learning uh, and responding to those things uh, might might uh, reduce. Uh, but of course, you know, the bank capital framework at least, and certainly elements like the country's capital buffer, are intended to respond to the risk environment. That is their design. And the risk environment uh, is constantly uh, evolving. So I think there is also a, a dimension of, uh, you know, we, we have to, and the world also kind of needs to realize that there's an element of bank capital regulation that it is more dynamic by design to respond to, to the risk environment. Okay, perhaps we have time for at least one more question, David. Thank you. Um, Tobias talked about the need to be proactive in building buffers and adjusting to the risk environment. What should we be doing right now with buffers? What's your sense? Are we at a neutral stage or should we be above neutral or below? Interested in your views. Uh, who, who wants to take that? Uh, class, perhaps, first off? Well, it's a very difficult environment now because there is, uh, I guess, the reason not to build buffers is always procyclicality, right? That is the argument that at some point you can't hear it anymore, but okay. Uh, but now, probably in the current environment, there is reason to actually worry about procyclicality since uh, the economy is uh, clearly slowing down. Uh, credit, uh, at least in the euro area, credit demand is slowing very, very strongly. That's a feature of the monetary policy, not a bug, a feature. But it is what it is. So at this moment, uh, I think uh, there are uh, some reasons to worry about procyclicality of uh, significantly strengthen macro prudential uh, macro prudential uh, tools at the same time the banks are still quite profitable so asking the banks to set aside some additional capital is still possible so it's a difficult call i already mentioned with hindsight i think 2022 is actually a missed opportunity because in 2022 you heard the same argument about procyclicality and some uh, in some countries country cyclical buffers were still strengthened but there were also other countries and, and also the larger countries in the euro area that unfortunately did not uh, use the opportunity in 2022 because of fear for procyclicality but if you look back 2022 i mean profitability was good the economy was strong uh, but risks were building up so with hindsight that was the time to do it so that shows how difficult it is to make an excellent uh, assessment. And if you're risk averse people, and we are as central bankers and supervisory community, we, we always see risks, right? I mean, the word crisis is never far away in, 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 in audiences like this. Then there might be actually, that might be one of the reasons of in, for inaction bias, that we are too fearful of crisis and too often f afraid of procyclicality. Um, <laughs> Could I add to that um, comment just to build on Klaus's um, response? I think um, the point about 2022 is exactly on. 
currently banks have started to tighten lending standards for commercial CNI loans and for real estate loans, especially commercial real estate in the US and in a lot in the UK and European economies. And I get one important question in terms of whether you would want to build a buffer is to what extent the tighter lending standards reflect capital constraints. Um, you know, if they're already feeling that that's a constraint, then you may not want to like tighten. I don't know how one empirically disentangles that. It feels like a good research project. <laughs> um, but I think that's like one of the considerations for thinking about whether you'd be um, leaning into already a tightening cycle, um, like it's too late or there is still time. Um, I think the interest rate and the real estate cycles might have different timing. And so if you're thinking it, it's not necessarily too late, if it's, um, um, if it's, you know, just higher for longer, you know, interest rates, just, uh, wanted to just add that point. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's a key uh, question, key issue to uh, uh, to keep uh, uh, considering as we go forward uh, uh, into the uh, into the continued uh, tightening cycle. And we can, uh, of course, also discuss this further in the context of this uh, conference. Uh, but I think uh, our time is up. So um, um, uh, unless someone wants to come come back in. Uh, or there are burning questions in in the audience. I would uh, I would like to thank uh, all four uh, panelists: uh, Klasnot, uh, Vasmaduros, Tobias, uh, and and Nelly uh, online for their uh, contribution uh, today. Thank you very much. You're welcome.